and uh, thanks for being uh, here today and to share the program uh, with us. Um, we're talking about dog whistles and uh, the impact that they have in terms of uh, splitting the working class and the effectiveness of that uh, of strategy that the right has been employing for quite a, quite a bit of time now. And our speaker today is Anita Waters, and uh, she's going to lead off the discussion and uh, on this topic. And after that, hopefully we, we can we can engage in in the further discussion and uh, and, and and see what the outcome is of uh, this really fascinating topic. So uh, Anita, without further ado. Well, let me ask you, uh, what, how should we do this? How many minutes should I take or should I stop for questions or, uh, or um, discussion? What do you think? Generally, generally our practice has been, um, you know, 15 minutes or so. Okay. All right. 15, 16, 17 minutes, however you want to do. Uh, our, our meetings here, we have these meetings once a month and what we really promote is uh, discussion. That is really a very important part of our meeting. Uh, right. Folks to really get into the topic matter. And um, so so you go ahead and feel comfortable with it and, uh, and then we'll have a, a discussion and hopefully we have uh, a few people going online and uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, okay. sounds good. Um, so, well, I, I know everybody got the article, but I, I, um, and so I won't really go over all the points in it, but, um, but I will mention that, uh, you know, a couple of the main points and then um, mention areas where we could really discuss it. So um, the author of this is uh, uh, Ian Lopez, and he's a law professor at University of California at Berkeley. Um, and he prepared this paper for the AFL-CIO in 2016. Um, and when I first thought about dog whistle politics, I was, I was afraid it was going to be about psychological reactions to politics and the, at a very psychological level. But uh, Lopez is really good at keeping his eye on the structural racism that's really the most significant uh, problem. Now this article was published right, right uh, into six months into Trump's campaign, uh, before he even was nominated by the GOP. So um, the analysis um, is intended really to get discussions started by people um, in the union uh, movement about racism in politics, and it, it helps to to you know guard uh, to build up a guarding you know to guard yourself against being influenced by it. And if you are aware of dog whistle politics and you hear, for example, Ron DeSantis saying that Floridians should not monkey with the way the GOP has run things in that state, it's immediately recognized as what it is. And I'll be interested to hear from your um, standpoint uh, in Illinois, what uh, dog whistle politics have you heard um, in local races? Um, now, he defines dog whistle politics as um, using code words that don't really explicit refer, explicitly refer to race or whatever um, group is being uh, demonized, but uh, are fraught with racial meaning. And it's really nothing new. He says the tactic took, took off after the civil uh, rights movement and had been employed by Barry Goldwater and Richard Nixon. And really, the idea of these dog whistle politics is part of a bigger uh, picture that we call symbolic politics. And that really goes back to forever, actually. So um, they've been used especially enthusiastically by Republicans, he says, since the 1960s. And it really has hit its pinnacle uh, with Trump. He argues that this kind of politics is the gravest threat to the labor movement and to democracy itself. So the, art, the author is really clear on one point that we stress as communists all the time, and that is that racism really uh, hurts both um, uh, 
uh, white workers as well as workers of color. Uh, racism chains both, as the Hugo uh, Geller poster says. Structural racism, it's more than uh, individual racial prejudice. That's caused, he says, the most extreme violence inflicted on black, brown, and Asian communities. And as it's inflicted on those communities, there's carryover to all workers, including white workers. And his, the example he gives is the way mass incarceration uh, went up, rates went up ex exponentially. And of course, uh, African-American and other uh, workers of color were um, disproportionately affected by that increase in uh, incarceration rates. It's really um, uh, white workers have been, uh, you know, swept up in it as well, which is an interesting point. I think about um, how Rick Scott and other uh, Florida, uh, Floridians in uh, the GOP actually did support uh, or never spoke against uh, extending uh, voting rights to um, felons because there were a, a, there were um, no doubt a section of those felons who will be uh, supporting the Republican Party. So um, Lopez also has a, a section called what to do, but this is, he goes more into detail later about uh, how to solve the problem. Um, but the first way is to convince whites to fight racism by broadening racial conversations, he says, to show whites how their lives are degraded by racial politics, not only morally, but also economically. That is, white workers are, are hit uh, economically by racism. And the second is to convince people of color to keep, um, to keep whites on their side and be able to harness their political power. And, um, and, and to recognize the class basis of, um, of the, the process. So at every opportunity, um, the goal is to connect dog whistle politics with economic harm to the whole working class. And that's something that we would go with too. Um, so although both parties use dog whistle politics, Lopez identifies the GOP as the party that most indulges in dog whistle politics. And that's resulted in drawing that party closer to being white identified. And what um, one notable kind of shocking fact that he had in there is since 1972, no Democratic candidate for president has won a majority of the white vote. And today, 90% of GOP voters are white and 98% of GOP elected officials are white. Um, that reminded me of the, um, uh, a, I got to see Terrence uh, Melvin, who's the uh, national president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists speak at an Ohio AFL-CIO event. And he talked about how infuriating it was for him to hear people say that the two parties, the two major parties are, you know, just about equal or there are no differences. He said one of them embraces white supremacy and the other one doesn't. And that's the clear difference. So another good point that Lopez makes uh, is that that white supremacist idea serve a dual purpose. One, they divide the working class. And two, they demonize government itself. And here he's talking about government. Maybe it was clearer to see government this way in the Obama years as a way that labor rights are protected, public goods are provided like education and infrastructure, and a safety net is provided for, for uh, individuals. Um, and he, he uh, but but that's that's the kind of government that's demonized by this dog whistle politics. And one of the areas, one example that brings it all together is Ronald Reagan using dog whistle politics to uh, get people pissed off at African Americans using government assistance. And in Lopez's view, he says the end result is not the end goal is not establishing white supremacy, but just weakening governments winning elections and dividing the, the working class. But I, I think maybe he's a little too quick to say that the uh, GOP isn't really interested in establishing white supremacy. So um, I have a nice quote here. I uh, can't remember what page this, I didn't mark down what page it was on, but he says, the combined message is venomous. 
government coddles non-whites with welfare and slap on the wrist poli policing. Meanwhile, government victimized whites by taxing their paychecks and refusing to protect them from marauding minorities. So that's the that's the the upshot of what he's um you know the message of these dog whistle politics are. Um, of course, Lopez contends it isn't the discourse that hurts workers, rather it's the policies that these discourses justify and um, and rationalize. And uh, um, he, he, he recognizes that um, even uh, working class people themselves are now, a, 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 there's dog whistles to indicate um, without saying poor people to talk about poor people in a disparaging way or uh, other targets like Muslims, for example, that's another one. Jews, in fact, when when Trump talks about um, George Soros being a, a, a globalist, it's really an anti-Semitic uh, dog whistle. So um, he does say, and I think this, I appreciate this, that not all whites are susceptible. You don't have to be susceptible. You can train yourself not to be susceptible to these frames of understanding. And some people of color are susceptible to these frames. So, um, and uh, he he thinks that as the population gets less white, instead of lessening dog whistle politics, some white uh, people are even more anxious about that. And they are trying to expand who is recognized as white to include certain other groups. Um, he also has a section on types of racism, but I didn't find this as useful as as others the other two sections. Um, the kind he, but I do agree with him that the kind he believes is most important is what he calls strategic racism, which uh, takes the focus off the question of whether an individual is a racist or is not a racist, and instead looks at the deliberate use of racist discourse to justify or rationalize policies that take rights away from people of color and uh, of workers of all ethnic uh, backgrounds and genders. So um, the uh, really good part of the article is how to fight back. And I think from our standpoint as communists, it's the most important. Um, he says, first, we sort of have to look at our own organizations. And he's talking here about unions, sort of an examination of conscience. What is what is the racial composition of this organized group, and uh, what is the racial composition of different different groups? Who are workers? Who are organized and un unorganized workers in the community? Um, and how is racism structured into our practices? Uh, second, uh, to convince whites to fight racism, and third, to convince people of color to link race and class and, and build those kind of class solidarity. And mo but his fourth and most important um, uh, way of fighting against dog whistle politics, he says, is to build a new movement and a new sense of ourselves as workers with, uh, he says, belonging, mutual respect and mutual care at the center. So he says, Labor must strive to give people a new positive sense of themselves um, as workers, as, as, as the working class, I, we would say. Uh, now, Lopez sees unions as a main driver of this movement, but they have to start seeing themselves as something bigger than their own labor actions. Uh, he thinks unions can give the movement three things, uh, narratives, networks and resources and um and i think other other groups have those uh narratives networks and resources as well to contribute um the new let's see 12 minutes let's see um okay so he does um talk about some new developments uh oh i think i mentioned that and i i don't want to go into it in any more detail right now um but uh, so this new movement that he's talking about um, has to demand, he says, that government serve people over profits. So it's really in line with what we agree uh, with. Um, a new government, a government that protects workers' rights, though, is the best that Lopez is going for. So he stops short of demanding any kind of fundamental change in social structures that um, that 
you know, these social structures that perpetuate the exploitation of workers. So he's not challenging capitalism as a system. He stops short. So um, two things that are important to us as communists. First of all, can words and language really make a difference? And, and that's something I've struggled with because I've been studying political symbols for a long time, and it's something that really interests me. Um, and I, but I, I am a Marxist, so am I talking about ideas and and instead of structures? But but what Marx is, I think what we can, how we can tie that together is what uh, we're talking about here is what Marx refers to as class consciousness. That is developing a class for itself with a sense of its own unity and its own potential power. Um, and framing discourses like this um, can have a, an influence. And then uh, secondly, uh, and as communists, uh, and finally, what's important to us is uh, the, um, the fine line that we, uh, we, we walk between uh, keeping class analysis in the forefront, um, but we still recognize the importance of political action that's based on other foundations of unity like race or gender or religion. Um, so all of these things are, are important. Um, but I think I, I think we see dog whistle politics all the time. It's unfortunately, uh, now that we're, we're well into the Trump administration, I think we're not even seeing dog whistles from him. We're just seeing blatant uh, racist um, speech. So, um, so that's what I have on this article. And I'd be really interested to hear what um, Illinois' experiences are um, with uh, with the local elections that you've had, or what you've sensed in in um, as well, especially local elections, because the the uh, congressional uh, elections were so important, the House of Representatives elections. So um, that's that's it. That's fifteen minutes and seven seconds. Anybody okay. there? <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that uh, for that open. Very, very good. I'm sure there will be a, a lot of questions. Uh, uh, so uh, how, how do we want to do that, uh, Karen, with the questions? Just ask or? Yeah, just ask. OK. I'm so oh, yeah. OK. Well, let me, I, will, I will ask uh, maybe one question. Uh, OK. I found the article to be uh, uh, very, very good and, um, you know, thought provoking. And I was thinking back on my, um, my experience, especially at labor unions uh, and, and, and with white workers. It seems to me like there has always been a lack of talking uh, uh, between uh, white workers and workers of color, you know, about the question of, of, of racism uh, and uh, its impact. And even like in uh, union negotiations or around questions on the, on, on the uh, work floor, there's really no real discussion of impact of, of, of breaks um, openly. And, and I, I just think that on some level that's, uh, <coughs> that's, uh, that's lacking. I'll say that. Should I respond to each this way, right? Are you done? Are you? Yeah, that, yeah. Well, OK. I'm, yeah. Um, Thanks. I, I agree that, um, that that I think that talking about race is the most important first step. And I think that's why this article came out. I mean, the, it was clear if you got the whole article at the end, it had almost like discussion questions or, or something. I can't even remember that part of the article. But it was clearly um, designed to get, you know, groups starting to talk, talk about issues of race. Um, and, and I think another another thing that, that might help um, spark th those discussions, and I think that they're really important, is um, a great uh, a great speech that Richard Trunka gave to uh, 
in Ferguson right after uh, the the um, Michael Brown it was that was shot to death in in Ferguson. Um, uh, he gave a speech at a, I guess St. Louis um, event about um, about our our approach uh, to well his the AFL CIO's approach uh, to race and what needed to be done, which was a kind of a beginning of, of this kind of or a continuation of this kind of. Um, uh, thinking. So I agree that just communication or 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 um, ways of starting those discussions is really an important step. Um, yes, I have a, a, I don't know if it's a question exactly. I mean, in my many and varied interactions with people, um, I see quite a few examples of dog whistles and not all of them are racially motivated. Um, one close friend of mine, I don't know where he gets this, but his particular dog whistle is a, a contradiction in terms called a Marxist czar. A Marxist what? A Marxist czar. I never heard such a phrase. I cannot find it anywhere on the internet, but it totally turns him foaming at the mouth and falling over backwards like a dog whistle. Oh, no. It's like, this is, look, there's no such thing, I promise you. Marxists and czars are mutually incompatible. Right. And there's some far right, there's some far right wing um, video blog of some kind. And he goes on that and he's absolutely just, um, Incoherent with rage, and <laughs> Soros usually gets talked a lot about in this in these nonsensical conversations. Um, it's it's one thing if you have one person, but it, they are very effective at dividing the work the working class. This is just one dog whistle of very many. Mm -hmm. It's it's. Yes, dialogue is key, um, but how? That's the big question, is how to defeat the dog whistle politics. I have yet to um, find an effective um, technique other than dialogue and hopefully with time mm -hmm. with people. But a lot of this dog whistle stuff makes no sense at all. And you cannot reason something like that. You cannot reason somebody with somebody that's not using their brain, their right. emotions. It's like the whole point of the dog whistle is something that normal people hear and either ignore or discard it as nonsense. But it hits home with the the victims, and they go completely bonkers. They have a very visceral reaction. And I have yet to find an effective um, dialogue. That is bizarre. It's it's fairly widespread. It is. Yeah. Well, that's bizarre. Before Anita responds, may I uh, add to um, what uh, is being placed on the table? Please. Um. I uh, was talking to my brother the other day, and my brother is African American, and he mentioned uh, the issue of uh, of immigrants. And he said, when he saw this commercial that I did not see, but he said when he saw that commercial, Trump's warning. Mm -hmm. Uh, was given greater gravity. So uh, here is an African, and this article talks about how people of color can be influenced by the dog whistling. So I'm thinking that this commercial uh, about immigrants uh, included uh, visual dog whistling that was very uh, very effective. But 
again, I, I didn't see it. Uh, but this is my question. Given the influence of dog whistling on a significant section of the population, and given the barriers that are created, uh, we, we don't support uh, people helping programs because the beneficiaries of those people helping programs are largely lazy, good for nothing, uh, uh, don't want to work people of color, and, and uh, in large part, uh, black people of color. So I'm wondering if a part of our political uh, challenge in dealing with those who are a bit more conscious and those who are less conscious, <coughs> uh, whether or not it has to do with still trying to, as Carrie indicated, still trying to reach in and see where you can pull these forces forward uh, even even though the whole issue of 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 uh, race has been totally uh, vulgarized in their heads, and 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 a barrier has been created to their support for certain left oriented uh, policies like. Uh, free public education, well, they're lazy and good for nothing. It's throwing money away. Uh, free uh, low-income housing, well, if they would get up and go to work, you know, why would they need low? It's throwing money away. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if part of what we're struggling with is trying to still reach in uh, to those forces with less left-oriented uh, approaches uh, to uh, uh, reach them where where they are is is so I guess is there a connection between the problems created by the barriers of racism and this whole thing that we talk about left center <laughs> left and center. Okay, shall I respond then now? So yes. that's before I forget what you said, <laughs> yes. because that was a complicated question um, it, uh, and it went a lot of different uh, directions, but I, I want to, I uh, especially, well, the last thing you said was, is there a connection between those barriers that are drawn and the left? Uh, I'm not really sure how to answer that part, um, but I think I think what we have to do, I think you're right that, that, that the, um, the focus is on the barrier the, or the boundary that's created. And um, sociologists talk about that all the time in ethnicity where you have a, you have boundary maintenance work. Like you, you have people who have, um, who go forward and, and, and write books or give speeches about how you know, uh, like whites are different from other people, or even that that people of, of um, uh, that Latinos are a certain uh, are, are different than other people. So, so drawing boundaries around around people, and I think I think that um, that way to fight that is to show that those boundaries are are ephemeral and they're socially created, where or they're created by people. Probably, uh, you could say they're are created by capitalists, um, and those barriers are, are are faulty. And one way I used to uh, focus on this is to show people how um, I mean to talk about things like in the um, in the 1840s in Minnesota, to if you had a Norwegian person marrying a Swedish person, it was considered an interracial marriage. Uh, back then, it was like that was such a strong barrier between one Scandinavian country and another Scandinavian country, immigrants from those countries, that is, that that would be considered an interracial uh, relationship, and it was it was forbidden and 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 frowned upon. So these, in in the the in the big sweep of human history, these 
ba barriers and these boundaries between racial groups, for example, are really very shallow in our history. They're not, they're something that really come, it, it's getting, it gets invented in, uh, the, in historical time. So they're not, they're not primordial differences that we have with, with each other. Um, and I, I like, so I, I think any, any stress of, of common humanity as well as common commonalities in our in our class relationships are the way to to um, fight against these kind of um, dog whistle politics and, and that kind of um, you know uh, and oh yeah you started out with that that immigrants commercial I did see that commercial that uh, our president tweeted I think it was um, it was really it was really horrific actually. Um, and um, you know, showing a, 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 a Latino man, you know, he had a he very um, uh, proud of, of having shot a cop or something like that. But it was, and it was, it was so, it was so blatant. It was ridiculous. It wasn't even dog whistle. It was just, you know, um, a, a racist commercial. Uh, so, but I agree that there are, I mean, there are, dog whistles for a lot of axes of the way we're divided in like Jews and non-Jews or Muslims and everyone else or even atheists or um, or uh, Cubans and, and you know any national group any of those kind of groupings around which there are boundaries drawn um, there are dog whistles that can be that can be employed there are symbolic ways that People can talk about those groups and disparage those groups without coming right out and saying it. So, um, so I think I think you're right there. Are, but I think I think there is hope to try to um, reach some understanding about common needs, human needs, um, and uh, the common uh, situation that we're in um, economically, the common relationship to the, the means of production and the and the on a relationship to the capitalist class. Those are the kinds of things that we need to stress. I, I have a question. Uh, my question is this, what about the underlying assumptions that make dog whistling work? There has to be some type of foundation that these things are built on. So what are those assumptions that make the uh, uh, dog whistling work. Wow, that's a big question. And um, somebody else might want to want to jump in on these uh, hard questions uh, too. I um, I guess the underlying assumptions are um, well. There are there's like a set, I think there's a set of meanings that people have that you know when when uh, when when uh, Trump says George Soros people make associations. So he's assuming they're, they're uh, sharing in a common set, like a common cultural um, idea, configuration that includes George Soros and globalists and Jews and, you know, um, and elites and all of that. So you can say just George Soros and evoke all of those other things. Um, what about this? Mm -hmm. What about uh, saying a black man? What are the underlying some assumptions that, when you talk about a black person, there are some certain underlying consumptions that have been placed since slavery about right. what a black person is, mm -hmm. and that's why these particular, to me, that's why those particular uh, dog whistles just. Uh, uh, work not only on, 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 with white people, but but with black people too. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it is a, a, a you know it, it's it's a it it's a something a code word that that brings to mind certain set of meanings for people, and uh, and those are common set of meanings because where they come out of our you know out of our history and they're they're passed on from from. Uh, Generation to generation. Shelby, 
Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, this, the article and the questions that it, that it brings to mind, uh, a person's mind, at least in my mind, is um, many, many questions mm. come to mind. Um, but what's like, like Hale was talking about, what is it about uh, that dog whistles? What's the assumption? And, um, you know, I think, I think one assumption is, you know, you have to fear the other. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to fear the other. And, and that's, um, that's a long standing one, you know. I mean, talking about evolution, we have always feared the other. I mean, that's real. The fear of the other, um, and we're getting better at not fearing the other, um, because there's a there's a I think a lot of civility, and I think people fight for civility. People want to be civil, um, and even even in in um, you know this um, for example. There's a, a part, a part uh, in Michigan, sometimes I go to walk, and um, the area is predominantly white, um, heavily white. And it's just amazing to me that everybody who you meet speaks, hello, how are you? Hello, hello. <laughs> and that's, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And in and, 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 and the article, uh, uh, Lopez says that it's not you know, personality is policy. You know, so I was wondering this area, you know, I, I, I say in my head, I wonder how did this person vote? You know, did they vote? Did they vote as Republicans? Do they, do they vote, um, you know, strengthening right wing policy? Um, and if they do, that, that civility, that kindness, that nice, nicety, although appreciated, it really is it's not really very beneficial to me or to others who are not, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in a good place where a, a, a more healthy uh, a policy position would be. So, you know, I mean, that's like one aspect. It's just so much, I think. Uh, <laughs> and, and I was just close to say that he, uh, Lopez also says that it will, this new movement will take time. And, and I believe that, you know, I think that this, this thing really takes time. But uh, also the other side of that is uh, when you're hurting, time is, um, uh, doesn't seem to be kind. Right. Uh, and um, and a lot of times you would, you know, uh, time kind of like works against what you you're doing. Um, and I'll just end with this. I mean, I, I think in terms of practical matters, uh, in Chicago, building roads and building infrastructure. Ever since I can remember, a big fight from the African American community is. Where are the black men working on these projects, especially infrastructure and stuff? Where, and and uh, you know the unions are not good at doing what we would want them to do to help. You know, all workers see that the best situation would be for everybody to be a part of these projects. That the white worker would uh, would, would benefit from it, the black worker, the brown worker, and all. But, uh, but but it doesn't happen that way. But we still have to, you know, we know that we still have to take the the better position and try to fight. Um, um, yeah, and I really end this this time. I think dog whistle. I mean, when you take somebody like Clinton, you know, and then in, in the, the African American community, the Clintons are still seen as positive. You know, positive. Seen as what? Clinton, positive. Okay. You know, the black men pretty much like, like the Clintons. And, you know, in welfare, as we know it, was Clinton and lock them up. Was Clinton, you know? 
so, but we still have to, so we still have to, to struggle with that. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, oh, but the, but the dog whistles, you don't want to come out strongly and say these things openly. But I think our response is that we have to use a bullhorn to fight against those dog whistles and things that they they throw out there secretively and silently. We have to be in opposition very loudly against it. I'm finished. There's just one thing that I, I'm saying that the, 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 to me, the only effective way to really fight dog whistle is that you have to uh, uh, go after the underlying assumptions that make dog whistling work. If you don't attack that, uh, it, it seems to me that it's uh, uh, hopeless. You have to uh, dismiss and, and, get, and attack those assumptions that people have about a certain race or have about the other because it is fear of the other and that has to be attacked the, and and all of the assumptions that go along with what causes that fear and don't do that a, a dog whistling will continue to work, continue to work. I, yeah uh, just back to my singular example of my friend. <laughs> I've been trying to work on those fundamental assumptions mm -hmm. with zero success. <laughs> um, it's, I'm, I don't know. I know dialogue is the key, but this is not something that's born of rational thought. This is something that is is foisted upon people culturally and specifically and particularly intentionally to divide. Um, yeah, what do you call it? The czarist? Well, it's just one, it's just one know, of the thousand dog whistles. Yeah. And maybe a million dog whistles. There's a lot of them. Oh, yes. And this is just the most, the strangest one I've heard, oh, yeah. which is Marxist czars. I'm like, really? <laughs> I think they are talking about Soros, because yeah. I think I've seen that reference uh, mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, but I, I would challenge something that uh, Perry just said, that dialogue is key. Um, and I challenge it, and, and not to say that I have uh, solidly a different, uh, solidly an answer, but to uh, provoke uh, continued exploration. I'm, I wonder if dialogue is key. I wonder if we have to understand that people have to be engaged in a process because even those who are under the most uh, under the influence of virulent racism, they still, at least as far as I've seen, they still have a sympathy not for the multiracial working class, but for the working person as they see the working person and the working person is white. So I'm not saying they have have a, a sense of uh, so so uh, so Carrie, is that true that these people that you that you see as being totally blinded by uh, uh, racism, uh, and, and the influence of dog whistling, that at the same time, if you begin to talk about the uh, unemployment and you begin to talk about health care for them as whites, as working people whites, my question is, is there any kind of uh, break uh, in, in those categories? And if so, I think our challenge is to come to grips with uh, the possibility that it's in those areas that we have to pull them into struggle. And as a result of their experience, they will see, uh, uh, they will learn of a commonality. 
So it's not just dialogue. It's also trying to find a way to pull them into experiences yeah. where they where they begin to learn. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering. It's question mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Um, if it comes down to, I, I have actually brought this up about your own health care and stuff, mm -hmm. as opposed to those awful, lazy other people mm -hmm. that do nothing but soak up the social services and bask in the, bask in the uh, sun while we do all the hard work. <coughs> but it just doesn't seem to connect. It's like, well, I don't have any anyway. So it's like, so neither should anybody else. <laughs> so it's, it's like, um, yeah, I, I've actually hit that topic. And again, I didn't have much success going there. So I am kind of, uh, huh? You're talking to a lump in. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you it. Mm -hmm. But I think experience is very, is very key, and imaging too, because I just think, why is it that black people still support the Clintons or like the Clintons, even after they just dismantled welfare, after even they uh, uh, accelerated uh, the uh, mass incarceration? Why is it? What is it that well, I have seen one thing um, with the one black guy in our shop. Mm. He's come to see this. Mm. And he's very angry at the Democrats, and particularly the Clintons. Mm. And as a result, he's pretty much supporting Republicans because he has actually seen this. And he, from. I tried experience. to discuss this with him, and it's like, I. From what I can tell, he's very upset having been manipulated mm -hmm. and has taken a more destructive tack, though, mm -hmm. by jumping full Trump on us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like. Because that, that's, the, that's the only alternative that, that the left has been so suppressed that yes. that's the way that people go. Well, uh, Anita, it seems it's, 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 it's good. You know, I, I assume that, uh, and I think this is the case, that labor is taking this up more now, this whole issue that Lopez brings up. Um, you know, within its ranks uh, it, and within its uh, strategies and decision making, it's really thinking about these questions and thinking about how to uh, uh, reach its, uh, its membership. I, I know, I know. In 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 in, in my union, uh, you know that there, there was real struggle. There was struggle with uh, white workers in terms of, uh, especially the white workers who, I mean, really openly wanted to vote for Republicans. Mm -hmm. Wanted to vote for Republicans, and was critical of the union because the union did not endorse. Uh, uh, quote, enough Republicans. At that particular time, it was no Republican. Generally, my union would really, you know, just fight to the end, hopefully, that they could endorse uh, one or two Republicans. Because the membership, a, a, a big part of the membership saying, would say, how come you don't endorse Republicans? You know, and they would say, well, look at the policy that the Republicans are, are putting on the table. They're anti-us. You know? But, but yeah. it, it was a... a a hard struggle to try to win that. And then basically the idea is to try to get as many workers uh, as you can uh, to, vote, to vote a right. But I would have to say that they, that they, they have struggled to try to win those uh, uh, workers. So I think that that's, that, that that's uh, encouraging. And, uh, and, you know, and, and, and so much in this country that uh, is, is, is happening because Trump is such bad news and such a, a disgrace and, and you know so hor horrible and threatening. But you see a lot of really good stuff that white workers and, and all workers are doing in opposition to the, the Trump uh, agenda. So that's that's good. 
I, I really I want to jump in and, and uh, say I really agree about the, um, the the unions, and I think this this article is a good step uh, to get. Uh, well, I mean, if 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 people in those um, unions that still are white dominated, and I know there are some, and very conservative uh, um, unions too. I know there's one based in Cleveland uh, that is. Um, that is, I think, heavy duty machinery uh, operators that might be just those kind of people that you would see in a, um, in a you know, infrastructure uh, construction working. Um, and, uh, and they are very uh, conservative group um, and do uh, endorse Republicans and as, as their union. And, and I'm sure if they were to, to look at this article and, and say, well, look at your own you know, and what, what is its composition and what is the, what is, you know, I think they would, I'm sure they would have a hard time uh, doing that um, and would be resistant to it. So I think maybe getting some pressure to do those kind of, take those kind of steps from the AFL-CIO might, might help. I mean, um, we'll see. But I think as far as um, just dialogue or really working together, I agree that working side by side, I think I think we have to fight segregation on every level. Um, I, I think that will help um, help people see each other as, uh, or members of the other group, as human beings with human needs, and uh, and not, um, you know, if, if you don't know anything about a group or you haven't ever um, interacted, you're going to have a harder time. Um, or an easier time demonizing them and seeing them as the other. And I think one example of that is, is um, look where uh, people, where that immigration message uh, that, that uh, was going dog whistling from uh, the GOP in the last uh, election, um, places where there were a high number of immigrants, they don't go for that. They know it's not, it's not true. Um, they know that immigrants and refugees are, are should be welcome and, and are just human beings with in, in dire straits with real needs. Um, and and yet in the areas where there are no almost no refugees or immigrants, looking thinking about the map of Ohio in particular, where there aren't uh, where there are not a lot of um, immigrants, that that message does uh, resonate. So it's people who don't know. Um, I think. I think part of it is ignorance, really, and uh, and being and unfortunately we're being made more and more ignorant as we as we go on. I mean, if kids are going to go to charter schools and the charter school is based about you know I uh, uh, you know keeping a, a, a um, homogeneous student body uh, that that's going to just create more people who are unable to. Um, look at other human beings and see themselves in, in them. Um, that's, oh, the positive view of the Clintons. I wondered, I wasn't able to, to recognize who's, who was talking, but I, I wonder if that person who was, if you're, you who are shocked that the Clintons being seen still as positive, actually um, experienced the 80s or 90s, or are you too young for that? I don't know. Yes, um, I'm 77 years old. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're there. Because, I'm not there. When it comes to those policies to um, to reduce uh, uh, welfare or to reform welfare uh, and to um, to crack down on on, on crime, uh, you know, some of that that was supported by uh, in there was support for that in the African American community at the time and. And Bill Clinton, uh, Tony Morrison said he was our first black president, and in some ways he was. He was targeted like he was a black president, and uh, and there there are there are ways that he uh, you know could be analyzed that way. But so I, I I'm not I'm not so surprised that there's still positive feelings out there uh, for the Clintons. But I mean, yeah, they did some really horrible things, and I you know. Uh, uh, I think you know, yeah, we shouldn't downplay those things. But but people's feelings of you know leadership that they took from, from 
from Bill Clinton when he was president is still meaningful, uh, I think. So hard to remember now. <laughs> Uh, huh? Well, I don't know. I, I, I think maybe it's the image that uh, Clinton on some. I think maybe it may, may have been the image. Images are important, and they have a way of, of uh, forming opinions and whatnot. I still can remember plainly when he was on this show and he had on these glass sunglasses playing the uh, playing the uh, saxophone and whatnot. They think that he's somebody who's down to earth and what have you. And yet his policies are killing us. That was his dog whistle. Yeah, that was his dog whistle, yes. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of dog whistles that go either way, you know. I mean, you can always use symbols to evoke uh, meanings in, in groups of people. So, yeah. And, and another, another, I'm sorry, somebody else want to go? No, Shelby. Um, another thing, even, I think we have to look at dog whistle in the context of, 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 of the time, the times also. And um, because I need it, I think what you said about, uh, you know, in a lot of people, don't recognize that, but you're absolutely right. And I, I definitely remember that um, the black community was really oh, yeah. strongly yeah. saying our communities are becoming ravaged with games. You know, clean this up. Why don't you clean it up? Uh, and if you were really uh, serious, you would uh, clean it up. And um, now that war on crime thing, that I think that, that was really a call. Now this welfare, as we know it, I don't give Clinton any too much room on that. Uh, but 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 this question on crime, I strongly remember in Chicago. I remember the the extent of the gang warfare, and, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and, uh, and it was really bad. And and. Um, and, and so he, he said, you know what, I will clean it up. I will do that. Um, but then we have to talk about, I think, um, and especially as communists, you know, we have to always, it seems to me, assess every minute in time, every moment in time, and to see what what is the best for that particular for that particular moment. You know? Because uh, even when Clinton was locking them up, that was the wrong policy to pursue. Mm -hmm. But uh, but 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 what was our response? What was what what were we supposed to do? So I think the challenge would have been, you know, how 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 to respond to that, and uh, how to respond in a way that people would not think that we were just out of touch and just uh, crazy, you know. Um, and, and, and I always think that with communists, we have a, a huge challenge in that way, and it's difficult. Selby? Yes, ma'am. I think one thing that we have to consider is that the support for uh, the Clintons is organized. It's coming, it's coming uh, through the Democratic Party machine. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's a factor. And so uh, when it came to, when it comes to other elements, they actually, so we, we have two issues to deal with. The suppression of the vote is one issue, but the Democratic Party machine engages in the depression of the vote. So um, uh, clearly when there's someone running that 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 uh, that the machine doesn't support. They attempt. Uh, well, as we know here in Chicago, others may be confused, but in Chicago we're not confused. We know what the machine will do to pro to uh, stop uh, a non-machine force and promote a machine force 
So I think when it comes to examining the influence of uh, the Clintons in the black community, we have to take into consideration the factor of the uh, of the Democratic Party machine, including the pack of the uh, Congressional Black Caucus, which we found out is different from the Congressional Black Caucus itself. And the pack of the correct Congressional Black Caucus is heavily uh, supported by, by uh, corporate money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We found that out uh, in the, you know, in the last, uh, in 2016. So, so um, but I, I think this uh, exploration that we're engaging in concerning uh, how to best uh, challenge uh, racism is uh, very helpful uh, and uh, challenge it we must uh, because if that wins, then the ability of the working class to move toward its mission is, is undermined if that wins. <laughs> so we have to struggle with that. We have to. But it's not just a matter of land blasting that the... We have to go beyond. We have to find the ways to to be effective, and to reach into some of those segments. For example, what turned out those white women? Who? Uh, what turned them out? Was it Kavanaugh? Was it was it was it the Republican Party, and what they did with Kavanaugh, that what, broke the, the suburban with. Uh, suburban vote of uh, white women? They voted Democratic. Excuse me? Are the ones who voted Democratic, are you talking about Chicago yeah. suburbs there? Well, supposedly from this last election, there was a break. I was looking at it very quickly at work. Mm -hmm. There was a break in terms of the suburban and they say it's because of white women. Uh, and the Repub say every in the prior election, it went Republican. But in this election, and this is national, not, not just in Chicago, but <laughs> in this election, that suburban vote uh, turned significantly Democratic. So what caused that? We've got to look at it. And then figure out how to make it happen in Ohio because it didn't happen in Ohio. So, yeah, we had a bad. Tell us, tell us before we're done. Tell us about what did happen in Ohio. Well, um, we had uh, statewide uh, candidates: uh, Richard Cordray as, as governor for governor, um, Betty Sutton, uh, who's highly uh, tied to the trade union movement for his running mate, um, and then. Uh, and Sherrod Brown as our senator. And of course, Sherrod won handily. So there were a lot of, but uh, Richard Cordray and none of our statewide, I think none of our statewide uh, candidates won. And I, I worked hard in that election. And of course, Franklin County, I'm in, a, I'm in Columbus and it's a sea of blue. <laughs> Only areas where um, Cordray won were, area, were counties where were large cities and and everywhere else on the map uh went for mike dewine who was a republican um and and i think i liked richard cordray as a candidate he was you know not the most he, uh, at first people complained that he was a hillary kind of democrat but he wasn't quite he was a, an elizabeth warren kind of democrat and he worked hard in the consumer finance uh protection bureau um, and I uh, and I and he was smart and he said some clever things in the debates and he was, had the good positions on um, on uh, labor rights, um, you know, vowing to um, uh, veto uh, any right to work bill and 
And tomorrow, uh, the Ohio legislature is having hearings on the right to work uh, legislation. So uh, they want to turn around and try it. I, I don't think it's going to go anywhere, but they are having hearings on it tomorrow. So uh, it doesn't look good for, uh, I don't know why uh, this happened. Um, I wish I wish the, the blue wave that, that hit you know, like Michigan and Wisconsin and, and I guess Pennsylvania, I wish it had had reached Ohio and, and we're really trying to figure out how to how to make that happen. So um, we'll see, you know. Uh, I guess Mike DeWine is not the most Trumpy, it's not like Ron DeSantis or, or anything like that. He's not the most Trump supporter in the world, but um, it's it's not good. His his record on reproductive rights is really especially dismal. So We'll see. We're bracing ourselves. Okay. Well, I think, um, will, will, will there any other questions? We're going a little after eight now. And uh, I think we've had quite a, okay. a good discussion. Yeah. Uh, Thanks and, for uh, inviting me. I really appreciate being able to do this. Thanks. Well, we're, 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 we uh, appreciate uh, your contribution to this discussion. Uh, 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 it really, uh, I think we all thinking about this question a little bit more now mm -hmm. uh, in preparation for this discussion and uh, as it uh, went along. So uh, thanks again. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Good night. All right. Thank Good night, you. Mm -hmm. how, how are we doing? Uh, how was uh, how was Denise? Is she still there? Yep, she is still on, but she's muted. I'm I'm here. Oh, okay. Well, well, well what about uh, Anita? Do we? I, I I'm still here. Oh, am I muted? No. I, I, I'm try, I was trying to turn me, myself off, but I, I didn't click the right thing. But I'm leaving now. Okay. Okay. Bye. <laughs> uh, what? Let you know that you didn't have to be here. <laughs>